Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am honored to interview renowned Dutch cardiologist, Pim Van Lommel. For more than 20 years, cardiologist Dr. Lommel has studied near-death experiences in patients who survived a cardiac arrest. In 2001, he and his fellow researchers published a study on near-death experiences in the renowned medical journal, The Lancet. We'll be talking about that today. Dr. Lommel is the author of Consciousness Beyond Life, the science of near-death experience. Welcome to the program. So um, you talk about in your in your beautiful book, um, growing up in an academic family where you believed in, you know, you had the reductionist theory going on and very materialist. Um, can you share how you began this journey with um, studying NDEs? Well, it started a long time ago when I uh, started my, uh, my training as a cardiologist, as a rotating intern in 1969. I was working as a young doctor in one of the first coronary care units in the Netherlands. So um, before 1967, all patients with a cardiac arrest died because modern techniques of resuscitation CPR were not yet available. So electrical defibrillation, the shock, and external chest compression only started in 1968 or so. So it was the third coronary care unit in, in the Netherlands where I started to work. And we had a patient in the coronary care unit who got a cardiac arrest and we resuscitated him with several shocks, defibrillations. And then after about four minutes, he regained consciousness. And we as a resuscitation team were very, very happy. It was all new for us. <laughs> it was a doctor in charge. But the patient was extremely disappointed. And he told me, I'm going to a, to a tunnel, seeing the lights, seeing beautiful colors, hearing beautiful music, etc. And I have never forgotten this event. I never did anything with it as well. I was just started my specialization in cardiology. So um, only in 1986, I read a book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes in his extensive NDE, when he died as a uh, medical student in 1943, with double pneumonia, and he didn't receive antibiotics. They were not available for him. So he died. And his body was covered with a sheet. And the nurse was so upset that his medical student had died that he was able to convince the, the doctor to give him an injection of adrenaline right into his heart, which was quite uncommon in that time. But after nine minutes of death, he regained consciousness. He had a problem to find his body back because his body was covered with a sheet, but he saw his hand, and a hand there with his fraternity ring. So he knew that must be his body there somewhere. And I was so impressed by his NDE. He, he came uh, in '44 in Normandy, joining the troops uh, as a hospital, so helping people, not just not as a doctor. And he went, came into concentration camps as the first person, and he saw that what was happening. There was a concentration camp in Poland, uh, where most people had died or were dying or extremely ill. There was a Polish man who was the, the, the translator. He could speak uh, fluently English and German and Polish. And he was quite active and quite, quite uh, uh, sane as well. He was, he was positive, etc. So he was, uh, was, was wondering how many days or weeks he was in this camp. 
and he said, I'm here for four years now. And he told his story that he was in Warsaw in the ghetto and the Germans took out his family, put it in a row and shoot in front of his eyes, his wife and children. And he said, I have a choice. I have a choice to hate, or I have a choice to love. And he made a choice to love. That's how he went in the camp, how he ha always helped people, which helped him to be so well at the end of the war, because the help, the, the love energy was spread by him as well. So I was very impressed by this story as well, by, by George Ritchie. So when I, when I read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he wrote about his extensive NDE, I started to ask patients who had survived the cardiac arrest in the past if you could remember something from the period of a concert, from the period of cardiac arrest. And to my big surprise, out of 50 patients who had survived the cardiac arrest, 12 patients shared the MD with me. So as a cardiologist, I had the privilege to talk to people who could share the MD with me. And this started my scientific curiosity because I have always learned in university, medical school later, that consciousness is a product of brain function. So it should be impossible that people could tell anything about the period of unconscious, that they could have memories, that they could have spells of consciousness during this period of cardiac arrest. So because of, and they had until that time in 88, there had been just some retrospective studies done where you have a great selection of patients because who will answer your email? People mostly are silent, and don't want to talk about it. So you get a selection of patients who are able to do the email and, and willing to share the ID. And you don't know exactly what happens 20 or 30 years ago in medical circumstances. So in 88, we started a prospective study in the Netherlands in 10 Dutch hospitals with a total of 344 consecutive patients who survived cardiac arrest. And it is the only scientific design for a study as well. And um, we just only studied patients who had a cardiac arrest, which is called clinical death. And clinical death is a period of unconsciousness caused by the lack of circulation, lack of breathing or both. And it is the first stage of the process of dying. Because when you don't initiate CPR within five to 10 minutes, all patients will die due to uh, irreversible damage to the brain. So you should be very, that's the reason why coronary care unit started, to start as early as possible to start with the CPR. We know when you have an out of hospital arrest, only 10% survives and 90% dies, you are too late. So, um, with this study design, we had the possibility to know exactly what happens, how many minutes they were unconscious, how many minutes they have been, have cardiac arrest, what medication was given, etc. So we found in our study that 80% of those patients reported a near-death experience and 82% did not. And now the question was, what was the difference between these two groups? So, to our surprise, we found that the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, or the duration of unconsciousness, five minutes or three weeks in coma, or a very short ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest in, in the cath lab, did not match at all. So the severity of the lack of oxygen in the brain did not play any role to explain the cause, nor the content of the NDE. And we also couldn't exclude uh, psychological explanation like the fear of death before the arrest or the pharmacological explanation what kind of medication did the patients receive did not matter at all or the demographic factors like age gender or religion if they're christian or atheist didn't matter at all so the main conclusion in our study was that 80 percent of those patients patients reported an MD, and there was no scientific explanation at all why those 80 percent could report an NDE. You could exclude all the, until that time reported possible explanations. So there were no hallucinations, no lack of oxygen in the brain, no fear of death, no uh, dreams, no, no false memories, etc. 
But that was the main conclusion of the first part of the study, which took four years. And the second part of the study was a longitudinal study. So we did taped interviews with all patients who survived the cardiac arrest two years and eight years after the cardiac arrest, with a match control group of patients who survived the cardiac arrest, who did not have any memories to see if we could explain the transformation of patients. And if this transformation is due to the cardiac arrest or due to the near-death experience that had never been studied in uh, a prospective design before. And what we find that the classical transformation after the death experience, which is you lose a severe death, believing in an afterlife, uh, that um, a new insight of what is important in life, which is unconditional love, empathy, and compassion, to start with yourself, to accept who you are with all your negative aspects. We all have negative aspects as well. Start to accept them as well. And then to have empathy and compassion towards others and towards nature, because you feel connected with everybody else, with nature as well, with the planet Earth. So that's the reason these kind of experiences are also called experience of oneness or spiritual transformative experiences as well. And the third aspect, which is very important, that most people are very reluctant to talk about it, is enhanced intuitive sensitivity. They know what other people feel. They know what will happen in the future. And they're very reluctant to talk about it. So that was the conclusion of our study, that the transformation is typical for the NDE. We found that only 80% of the cardiac arrest had an NDE. But we know also that during cardiac arrest, the brain function has ceased. There's no brain function at all. So it should be impossible to report consciousness, let alone the paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness with memory from early childhood, with the feeling connected with people in the past. They took some place thing for you, for your sister. You know how sad she was. You, you know it. You're connected with the consciousness of others in the past as well. You know future events as well. You are um, connected with people who have deceased uh, loved ones as well. You can meet a uh, being of light with the feeling of unconditional love and acceptance. So you can go through a tunnel, uh, come to a war of to have the conscious return to the body. So all these aspects, all these elements can happen when the brain doesn't function at all. And I know you talk about the colors and the music and and also being more alive than than really here here in this earthly realm. Can you just comment on that? It's more real than real. I was home with capital. I, I've been there before. I've come from here. That's what they tell you. So it, it's impressive. And then the problem also is it's an ineffable experience. So there are no words for it. So depending on the culture, the religion, and your age, you will try to find words for it. So children will use different words than adults. And uh, Christians will use different words as, as, as Muslims or atheists. The people from, from Australia, indigenous people, use different words than, than the people in the Western world or in Japan or, or, or in South America. So uh, they try to find words for it, but it still is an Wow. So this must have just, when was your aha moment? I mean, wow, coming from your background well, and- Well, it took some while to accept yeah. uh, that this is, and because the main thing was as a cardiologist or some, as a physician was that we know that there is no brain function at all during cardiac arrest. We know and that have been studied before in induced cardiac arrest, for instance, for threshold meeting uh, in, in uh, testing in a patient who receive an ICD, internal defibrillator. Then you induce cardiac arrest, you induce ventricular fibrillation, and you know that within one second, the blood flow to the brain is zero. We know that they are unconscious within seconds. They lose all the body reflexes, which is a function of the, the cortex of the brain. 
they lose the brainstem reflex, the gecko reflex. You put a finger in some throat, someone's throat without any problem. The corneal reflexes are gone. The, there are whitened pupils who don't react to light. And the breathing center goes to the brain center, stops functioning, which gives the apex. They have no breathing anymore. And when you measure the EEG, which has been done in some studies in special testing, but also sometimes during surgery, when there was EEG monitoring and there was a cardiac arrest during surgery, you see that the EEG flat lines within 10 to 20 seconds. So we know from in our study, and there have been a total of four prospective studies in survivors of cardiac arrest, with a total of 562 survivors of cardiac arrest. One, American study and two British study that there have been never a successful CPR within 20 seconds. It always takes two to three minutes or more. So all patients in all those four studies must have had a flatline EEG, must have had no brain function at all, and still between 15 to 25 percent of those patients who survived cardiac arrest report clear memories from a period of unconsciousness. And that is striking. And that took some time to accept. Yes. And what about the scientific community now? I, I really think things are, things are changing and so many different accounts of NDEs by, by the Evan Alexanders and, you know, surgeons, doctors, neurosurgeons. And what, what do you think is happening in the scientific community? Do you think they're, they're opening up a bit more about this topic? It takes a long time. I think yes. I'm, I'm lecturing. I've been invited to, to, to for lecture medical students. They always ask me, but also the end of the medical studio as well, or young doctors as well, invite me to give lectures. I've been lecturing medical schools and lecturing for medical societies as well. I'm lecturing for universities. We still, the younger generation is much more open than the older generation. Yes. The older generation has a problem to be open to this new idea. Because there's a never proven assumption that the brain produces consciousness. And that's this idea, this never proved hypothesis, is still accepted by most neuroscientists, most philosophers, and most psychologists. And it's how they work, how they write the articles, how they get their research money. So sometimes they talk in private to me saying, uh, and tell me, you could be right. But officially, they say it's total nonsense until they retire. And there's no risk anymore. And that's no risk anymore. But there's changing. There's so what you call also Marjorie Rulikoff is tell the post-materialist science. So the problem in science is that what we believe is true is what we can measure, what we can objectify what we can duplicate and what we can falsify. Now consciousness, what we think and what we feel, we cannot measure, we cannot objectify, we cannot duplicate, we cannot falsify. This consciousness, what we think and feel is beyond our current science. And that's why most scientists have a problem with it. So we have to expand science to include subjective experiences, to include consciousness as well. And this is happening now worldwide, but it takes time. Yes. And as you, what you mentioned, when physicians or nurses have an NDE, then people are more willing to listen to them as well, because even when a doctor or physician have these kind of experiences, and I've met many doctors who said, what happened to me now? I've always said it's impossible. Now I've had it myself. Yes. So I've met quite a lot of physicians as well, also in the Netherlands and more conferences as well. So um, there's a change. The younger generation is open, much more open, but it will take some time yes. to, to change the paradigm. Right. How has this changed your life, or has it changed your life? I, I know the answer to that question, <laughs> but how is, in, in, in terms of the changes and also in knowing that there is something larger than us. Yes, I, I think it changed quite a lot. Um, I've always been, been open. Uh, let's see, I've been open to anthroposophy. Rudolf, I've read books from Rudolf Steiner. Um, 
But the best thing that people are open to share their NDE with me. So they always come to me and share it with me. So they feel they are safe with me as well. So I've talked to, to hundreds, perhaps thousands of people who share the NDE with me. And I've received thousands of emails from all over the world where people share the NDE with me. So they are open for me to me, and, and they know that I will listen. And I will, can listen without any comment and prejudice. And that's the problem we have. So having a near-death experience is a spiritual trauma because nobody will, nobody will listen. Doctors say, oh, it's just a hallucination, or they get some medication. And nurses are better, but even a lot of nurses won't miss, listen. But nurses are much better than doctors as well. Family men, members, friends will not listen. The partner will not listen. So the result is that more than 70% of the patients with any get a re divorce because the partner said it's not the same person as before his experience. So the first five to 10 years or longer are years of depression, loneliness, and homesickness before they get someone where they can share their NDE with them. Then they can start to accept the experience themselves because they cannot accept it because it doesn't fit in our Western society. Right. And after that, they can start to integrate the experience, which takes another 10 to 20 years. And then they can start to live according to the new insights. So it's hard work for them as well. Yes. And I've met people who had an NDE 50 years ago and it will not still were not able to talk about it. We did a short study in, in the Netherlands on more than 80 people who had an NDE, people who had an NDE in the past, with a mean interval of 28 years before our interview and the moment of the NDE. With the mean interval of 28 years, still half of them were not able to talk about it. So what I said, it's a, it's a spiritual trauma as well. It's not that easy. The content is wonderful but to be able to accept it, to share it with others, and to integrate it into your personal life is really hard work and takes years and years. And it seems that those that do, do talk about it, or even the ones that, that can't, I would, that they say that it's still like it was yesterday. And once again, more real than anything like it is here. here. No. But when I did a taped interview with two years and eight years, they used about the same words, the same sentences for in both interviews. So, so they, they still use the same words and they have still the same impression. But you said that it had been 50 years before, it is more like it happened yesterday. And they still have all the emotions. And you can feel the emotion when they try to put it into words and they're very emotional mostly. Yeah. Wouldn't you think that the world would be so excited about this news that, that there is a continuity of consciousness after bodily death and something, what a beautiful thing to really look forward to. <laughs> I would think that, um, that the world would be just more, more open or more hopeful what do you think that's about? I think you're totally right. When you realize that about 50 or more than 50 million people in the US have had an NDE, more than 20 million people in Europe, but all over the world, there must be many, many more who have had an NDE, which change your ideas about life and death. Another thing is that after death communication, Yes. That you are in communication with the conscious of deceased relatives. In Europe, there must have been 125 million people. Yeah. But they don't talk about it. They don't dare to share it with others because they think it's, it was just a dream or people don't believe me. And it's the same with the death experience. You cannot share it with others. So first, have to, to be able to listen without any prejudice and without any comment to all those people. And then we are able to hear all those patients. And then we can change ourselves. Because when you're open to this kind of experience, you will change yourself as well. But even by reading a book about any, or listening to people, looking for YouTube films about people who share, you will change yourself as well. Yes. The, more the, main, you think... yeah, the main thing is that they tell you everything is always connected. Everything what you will 
due to others will come back to you yes. in positive and negative way. So when you give love, you receive love. And when you give hatred, you will receive hatred as well. And with this insight, you change your life. And it is also about when you help another person to be nice or help another person to help the two different kinds of intentions. And only willing to help the intention is good. Right. Well, it also all goes back to the golden rule, right? Which there's a part of that in every every religion, every, every religion in, oh, yeah. in the world. It's called the golden rule. <laughs> yes, yes. If you want to do to others, they'll come to you back as well. Yeah. Can you talk a few minutes about the life review? Because yeah. that's, if we, I, I live that, I live my life now with that in my mind every day. So can you can you talk about that? First of all, did you meet people with an NDE? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I've it's, studied NDEs extensively. So you but to talk to people is something different. As yes. Yes, I have. Yes. Sh shall I read an example of a life review? Please. I have a, a, a review. All of my life up till the present seems to be placed before me in a kind of panoramic three-dimensional review. And each event seemed to be accompanied by consciousness of good or evil, or with the insight of, into cause and effect. Not only did I perceive everything from my own viewpoint, but I also knew the thoughts of everyone involved in the event as if I had their thoughts within me. This meant that I perceived not only what I had done or thought, but even in what way it had influenced others, as if I saw things with all seeing eyes. And so even your thoughts are apparently not wiped out. I always say, tell, think about it. Your yeah. thoughts never wiped out. And all the time during the review, the importance of love was emphasized. Looking back, I cannot say how long this life review and life insight lasted. It may have been long, for every subject came up. But at the same time, it seemed just a fraction of a second, because I perceived it all at the same moment. Time and distance seemed not to exist. I was in all places at the same time, and sometimes my attention was drawn to something, and then I would be present there. So this is a kind of good example of a live review as well. Yes. Oh, wow, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So, you know, my, my passion is children. And I know I sent you these, these questions, you did get those. And if you could, if you could take a walk with your five year old self after a loved one or a beloved pet had passed, knowing what you know, today, what would you say to yourself to comfort? That's a long time ago. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and for me, as a young boy, I was living in nature. We had a chicken and we had cat and we had dead animals as well. And I, I accept that it's totally normal. Yes. We buried yeah. the, the, the animals in our garden and it was normal. There was nothing strange at it as well. So it was not uh, a problem for me. And it was also uh, in our class, but I was, I was at eight or nine that one of the girls in our class died from, a, from an illness. And it was sad, but I, I was not upset by it. So perhaps it's strange. But, uh, and I think what is also important, perhaps in chapter four of my book, I write about NDEs and children. Yes. And, and that's so important because uh, when children have the NDEs at a very young age, let's say in complicated childhood, or being in coma at a young age or complicated surgery or whatever, near drowning, under the age of five.